the Italian branch of CNBC. And yes, I come from the country which had really a privileged view on the SSM experience in the making in the last three years. And uh, we know a lot about what has been discussed today. And we heard very relevant policy messages, especially in the morning we had vibrant discussion. We heard bright ideas and great vision of the future. And I'm really happy that the world business is back on the headline of our panel, sustainable business model for today's banks, because there are some very basic questions that are like the elephant in the room, like uh, in this environment with negative interest rates, with digital transformation, with regulatory pressure, is a sustainable business model does really exist for banks? Can banks make money and help the economy? How can they tackle the profitability challenges? Where do we set the boundaries between supervision and management of uh, banks? And how can we and banks can uh, survive with the disruption of uh, technology? So we are happy because we do have a terrific lineup of guests here. And I introduced this briefly, Andreas Dombre, who's member of the executive board of the Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, and we have some Sabine Lautenschlager, Vice Chair of the Supervisory Board and Member of the Executive Board of the European Central Bank. Jean-Pierre Moustier, who's CEO of Unicredit SPA. Jose Maria Roldan, Chairman and CEO of the Asociación Española de Banca. And Belen Romana, Non-Executive Director of Banco Santander, with a long experience as a civil servant. She was Head of the Treasury in Spain for a long time. I would like, Sabine, to start with uh, Sabine Lautenschlager, to start with you. Because assessing business model, analyzing business model, is at the very heart of this rep, and you've been doing this. And uh, can you start telling us how do you implement the assessment of business model? How do you value business model? What's the ultimate goal of this? And what are the evidence in your latest experience in this? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, it will not be a surprise that um, all of the supervisors around the world look in depth into uh, the business models of um, the different banks. And there is not one business model being the most successful uh, ones. That I can tell you just up front in order uh, to decrease uh, the suspension um, uh, here. Um, we, we are looking into the business model as, as one uh, pillar yeah, in our supervisory review and evaluation process, um, taking the comp comparative advantage we have as the SSM by um, doing benchmarking in a quantitative, um, um, uh, in a quantitative, on a quantitative level, looking into different business activities, um, uh, being comparable to other banks, and then um, um, seeing what kind of evolutions do we see as a trend, um, and where are banks in which kind of business activity successful, and which what kind of underlying facts are they uh, successful. And as we do have 125 um, systemically large banks, um, we do have a kind of, yeah, we, we have a scope to look at. Yeah? This is one of the advantages of the SSM, to have this kind of quantitative analysis. But it's not only about quantitative analysis. It's about looking um, into qualitative aspects, too. It's about supervisory judgment. Everybody here who is a supervisor knows this. It's supervisory judgment, too, uh, with regard to what kind of macroeconomic environment does the bank right now have? How do they cope? Yeah, with this environment, um, what kind of plans forward-looking do they have and what kind of mitigating factors can they uh, draw upon when the macroeconomic environment is not as favorable as they would wish um, uh, to have it. All this, you know, together with what kind of risk emerge and what kind of risk management yeah, we look at, and then it comes together in a kind of scoring yeah? It's not a rating model, but it's in a kind of scoring, uh, which then mo um, uh, follows um, into to a capital add-on if necessary, yeah? what, and in many outcome? qualitative yeah. measures. What's the outcome of this, this job? I mean, would you eventually pick up the phone and say, Jean-Pierre Moustier, you have to do more asset management and less lending, no. more investment banking no. and less? <laughs> no. Again, we are not the better banker, and this is not our task. Our task is not to tell a bank manager, um, what kind of activities he or she should decrease or increase. This is a strategy question which has to be um, answered 
um, by the board um, of the bank. For us, it is rather the question of, do we assess the business model as viable? And uh, what kind of risks come out of these business models? And how do we act uh, with regard to our supervisory expectations towards the bank um, on the basis of our um, assessment of the viability of the business model? Jean-Pierre yeah? when you launched the Transform 2019, the, the new plan, strategic plan of Unicredito, did you knock at some door here in Frankfurt to have advice on you know, how to create a sustainable and successful business model? What did you do? Did you do? Well, we, of course, uh, always have a very proactive interaction with, with the regulator, and that goes without saying. I think that uh, you know, when you look at uh, the overall uh, situation, the regulator, actually, the challenge of the threat is uh, very healthy because uh, you know, we, we tend to look at ourselves on an inward basis, have discussion with our board on an inward basis, and the regulator gives us a challenge which uh, uh, mm -hmm. mentioned is more on the risk side, risk of the strategy linked to the strategy, risk uh, uh, linked to our liquidity position, that's another pillar on um, you know, credit position, on cost. And so you know, we can challenge ourselves. And um, I, I get from the SREP and the regulator actually a certain number of issues which can become priorities and we put against our risk appetite framework as well. So I think, uh, you know, we, um, and it's not because we're in DCB and I want to leave this building free afterwards, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we need to, to look at uh, you know, our interaction with the regulator on a positive basis. And uh, um, I would uh, actually take a, a position which is to say, you know, if we have a, a bit more regulation, it actually could be a good thing. Why? Um, because um, you know, we're in a world today where when we look at banks, clearly the top line is going to grow, but you know, like the economy. And in Europe, the economy is not growing very, very much, actually. You know, a few percent a year you know, on, on a nominal basis. And so our shareholders will benefit if our cost of capital goes down, because uh, you know, our, our earnings will grow at whatever level. And for share price to, to perform well, you know, earnings growth will be one component, but the cost of capital decreasing is another one. And when we are stamped, regulated in Frankfurt with a strong regulator, it actually gives to our shareholders you know, the, the certainty that you know, our business model is properly managed, our risks are properly managed, and that our, our cost of capital should go down. So the proper interaction with the regulator, the ability to manage the risk properly is from time to time heavy. From time to time, we say that you know it's too costly, but it's if we say the normal tension with the regulator. But there is a very very strong benefit for our shareholders, and I think we need to maintain this uh, proactive uh, interaction, which today I think works very well. Andreas Dombre, how do you see this kind of relation, and uh, how do you see sustainability when? cost of equity remains higher than return on equity. Today, Mario Draghi said uh, return on equity has increased from 0.4 to more than 7%, but at the same time, uh, many banks are still looking for this uh, balance. <clears throat> Let me uh, start out by saying uh, a big thank you to the ECB to invite me, Ignacio especially. Now, the, um, the relationship between regulators and regulated banks um, should be a teamwork with very clear responsibilities divided. Um, regulators cannot do without banks. Banks cannot do without regulators. Now, um, and we are more supervisors than uh, really regulators. Now, the uh, cost of uh, equity is very low in Europe, uh, too low in Europe. Uh, and that at a time where the economy is growing rather strongly. We have had 17 quarters of uh, positive growth in the Eurozone now in a row. Uh, then when you would hope that um, you know, banks would do better because we have very, very little provisioning right now, which normally should help um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the bottom line. Now, it is not, as, as Sabina said, it's not the job of the supervisors to reinvent banking or to give advice on banking. It's our job to do plausibility checks, whether or not the assessment of the banks going forward um, connect risk and reward in a proper way and are plausible. Um, because we are interested in the stable banking system, which means we are interested in capital um, creation. We are interested in um, you know, the, the banks earning their, their cost of uh, capital. When you look at capital increases these days in Europe, whether in Italy or in Germany or in other countries, you see what kind of discounts you need in order to, uh, to, um, to issue new capital, which is not a system which is sustainable um, 
forever into the future. We need to get back to positions when uh, book values are above one, because uh, and that means where cost of um, equity um, or cost of capital is uh, higher than uh, where returns are higher than cost of capital, rather. Jose Maria Roldan, you saw this in the past uh, on the other angle as you were head of the uh, supervision of the central bank in Spain. Now, having the voice of banks, what do banks ask to create sustainable in the medium and long term business models today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start by saying that it's a great pleasure not just to be back at the ECB, mm -hmm. but back at this building. I worked in this building 23 years ago in something that was called the European Monetary Institute, a stage two division. Uh, the fact that you have no idea what this was about, it's a good news because we have made a lot of, uh, of progress in these 23 years, so uh, it's good to be back. Uh, um, on, the, on the side of, of the banking industry, we, are, we have this triangle of, of uh, regulation, uh, digital transformation, low interest rate environment. Uh, low interest rate environment, let me be very clear, when our core business is maturity transformation, and, and given where the, the yield curve is, maturity transformation hasn't got a value. It, it's, it's a miracle that we are being able to have a return on equity that is positive, that is increasing, and it's getting closer to the, to the cost of capital. So I think that uh, pressure works. <laughs> things are, are getting better. Uh, with normalization of interest rates, things will, should be easier because maturity transformation will have some, some value. Then, of course, the digital revolution, I think that it poses challenges to, to the banking industry. I would mention uh, the scalability factor to mention something that has not been uh, maybe, I mean, raised uh, uh, up to now. Uh, that poses uh, challenges for medium-sized uh, institutions and small institutions because there's kind of, a, there's a fixed cost element in all this digital revolution. And, you know, the bigger you are, the more this is going to be diffused, uh, uh, serving, you know, your, your hundreds of thousands of clients. When you are a small institutions and you have to adapt to this new digital world, you are going to have a kind of a fixed cost that is going to be more difficult uh, to recover. So scalability, let's not forget about the scalability in this uh, digital world. We can think about uh, any, I don't want to mention any, any names, but it, there are obvious names where, where scale is a huge element uh, going going forward. So some challenges, all challenges, uh, challenges for all the banks, but especially for medium-sized institutions and small institutions. And last but not least, uh, on, on regulation. And I think on regulation, what we need to understand is that the, the, this idea, which is not the idea of DCB, I'm sure that, that this is not the case, uh, but this idea that is sometimes floated around that we want to make banks like utilities, safe and boring. Well, banks are safer. But banks will never be boring because we are going to be tied to the cycle of the economies. Yeah. As long as the digital revolution does not guarantee that we are going to have cycles, I think that banks are going to be bumpy with the economic cycle. And uh, think about digital revolution. That's another element why this industry is not going to be boring for the next uh, decade. So let's not try to make banks uh, like utility companies. Banks need to to have a return on equity that compensates uh, you know, shareholders for the risk they are going to go through uh, the cycle. And I think that that's an element that we need to, to reflect upon. Let me check, Sabine Leitner-Schlager. Is this your idea, banks as utilities? No. no. No risk at all? No. I mean, the business of banks is to take risk. But as a supervisor, I wish them to know exactly what kind of risk they Absolutely. take and how the risk develop. Um, you know, in, 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 the, in the years to come. Yeah, so I, I want to have a forward-looking um, uh, perspective, and I want to have enough capital in a bank that uh, this bank is able to cover the risk, even if the risk increases, you know, with uh, uh, and through the cycle. Yeah? So this is uh, the job to look first for the bank um, managers, yeah, and then second for the supervisor. Um, do we agree? Um, to the um, analysis of the bis business model. Um, are we satisfied with the risk management uh, the bank has? And are we happy with the capital uh, to cover the risks? Belen Romana, what do you make of the main key factors to create a successful, at least sustainable, business model for banks nowadays? I think that, that when we talk about sustainable models, there are two different things. One is the cycle, and that means that you have to be resilient. To, to cope with low interest rates for, for the long run, which are cyclical, but I mean, it's taking long. Um, so you have to be really resilient. That would be one thing. The other thing is, is it's more structural, if you want, which is being able to adapt to market changes. And, and I think that, that we've been talking about digital. Digital means, I think, many things. One is 
it is extremely customer centric, which was not the case in the finance industry, uh, and it's the case in other industries. The other one is is being really um, efficient in a different way. We we used to. Uh, to, to, to be efficient, but I think this is more about um, being fast and change fast, which is a completely uh, different story, I would say. That, those are the, the two big things, and the third thing is, 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 is really make use of, of, of the fact that you have millions of customers and, and, and learn from that, which is, comes down to the third point, which is data. So the three things that define business models in the future or, or right now are those three ones. Uh, Andres Dombre, you started analyzing and writing also about uh, retail banks as an endangered species at the beginning it's of the year. It's a long time ago. It's so. a long time ago, but <laughs> you started, I mean, and the fight for survival is still on. What's the key ingredient of the one we discussed, or if there's any other, to find a new right balance, you know, between costs and revenues, new sources and streams of revenues for banks? Now, first of all, uh, banks are about clients and customer needs and how they fulfill their customer needs. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody else. And the faster, in this ever faster changing world, the faster you adapt, the better. And uh, at the end of the day, that's what um, Sabine meant, I think, when she said she's looking at business models. How quickly will you be able to catch um, the new business models of your customers and you have to react to them? Uh, so it's rather simple. Um, you need to be ahead of the curve and you need to be uh, courageous enough to adapt as quickly as possible. Jean-Pierre Mousset, what do you do to be ahead of the curve? Uh, what do you do looking at your business model for the future? Well, first of all, we keep our feet on the ground. Mm. I think it's uh, important that uh, you, know, you don't overreact um, uh, when you read the headlines, or actually when uh, I listen to you. I mean, uh, you know, bank under threat, you know, business model uh, it being dead or, or whatever. You know, it is not the case. I mean, you know, banks are actually health institutions which can generate profit. We are today in an environment which is a bit more difficult. But let's not write off the banks thinking that fintechs are going to replace them. I mean, I was a, an investor two years ago, so I had a lot of fintechs coming to see me. 25-year-olds who were telling me that bankers were a dead species and that they knew better. You know, I mean, I have some difficulties to believe that because, you know, when we compare ourselves to fintech, we happen to have 25 million clients and 50 billion of capital. They have no client and no capital, and they provide a, a very vertical service. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was meeting with a fintech entrepreneur recently. I think I run the marathon faster than him, and you know, I, I am a little bit more resilient than him. So you know, about stamina to be able to change business model, to change processes, we know how to do it at Unicredit, and we can be super fast when it makes sense. Yeah, I, so the question is not so much, you know, are banks a dying breed? The question is, as Andreas mentioned, is you know, it is very important that we are slightly ahead of our clients. I'm saying slightly ahead, not too much ahead. And we have two types of clients. We have retail clients on one side, and we have corporate clients on the other side. And you deal with them completely differently. On the retail client side, there is some change, which are very different between the Northern Europe and the Southern Europe. Italian uh, retail uh, clients actually don't use too much internet today. And so we're going to change in Italy much less fast than we could change in Germany, for instance. So you have to adjust your business model in the proper way because we depend on what our clients want. We, you know, everything which has been said today is absolutely right about being multi-channels, about offering issues. But what we need to do there is to make sure that you know, in an environment where the costs are, are important and the revenues are not going to grow very much, it's just to optimize our cost base. And you know, we were discussing about fintech and automation. We need to review the process and to make them optimal mm -hmm. at the same time while we offer a multi-channel side. That's for the retail side. It's, a, it's not very glamorous, mm -hmm. but it takes time. And when there's a good idea on the product, we copy a fintech idea. There's no patent in financial markets. So when I see a fintech which has a good idea, I either copy it or I use them as an integrator. That's fine. Mm -hmm. okay? Then we disrupt our business model. We offered in Italy, for instance, Apple Pay. And we're the first one, and I'm very happy to disrupt the business model by offering Apple Pay to our clients. It's actually benefiting us majorly in terms of perception, and we actually make money out of it. So, you know, why not? We offer Dali Pay as well, you know, for, you know, the Chinese tourists coming. So, very happy to disrupt this money. On the corporate side, it is a completely different uh, uh, thing because you need to have the client interaction. You need to make sure that you cover your SMEs properly, but they want to have human beings with them. So, what we do there, is we need to use data 
for the retail client in order to make sure that we optimize the marketing and for the SMEs in order to make sure that we have a better risk management system. Don't call that artificial intelligence. It will be many, many years because before we have artificial intelligence in, in banks. It's the smart use of data. We have a lot of data. We need to use them smartly. When you do that, you have at least work for the next five years to improve the bank and make them more profitable. Uh, Roldan, it's not just about disruptive startups. It's about digi digitalization of customers. We heard today that people is more likely to go to the dentist than in a banking branch. Is the traditional cost you, structure... You need to give me the name of your dentist, actually, because uh, I love to go to my <laughs> unique well, credit branch. That, I have but to say that yes, yes, today. Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. And this is the traditional cost structure. So many branches and clearly many people in branches still sustainable looking at the future. I have to think about the dentist. This was a question being raised to the young people. I think that they have good uh, you know, teeth, so they don't need to go to the dentist. Probably they don't know how it is. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think that there, we have to accept that there is kind of a, a, a generational issue. I, I don't see my, 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 my sons that are 29, uh, 25, and, and 19 going to, to a bank branch. They would not understand why they need to go to a bank branch if they can use you know, their, their smartphone to do the transaction. So there is an element. There are people that still need, you know, the branches, but there are other people that probably can can, can get, you know, uh, you can deliver the financial services to them without any any branches. And we will have to, to respond to the client needs. As the client need changes, we will have to change. Going forward, uh, I think that we cannot rule out that, uh, you know, the reduction of, of branches and, and, and employees will, will continue. What we are seeing in Spain is since 2008, 2007, 2008 was the maximum. Uh, a 37% reduction in the number of branches and 30%, 32% in the number of employees. Employees is kind of stabilizing, branches are still you know, uh, declining. Uh, well, we have to adapt to, to reality. This is a scale business and uh, with digital transformation, scalability is going to be even more relevant. So we will have to adapt. Uh, you have to take advantage of that in terms of, of cost, eh? in terms of being able to deliver to the clients, you know, uh, Better, better services, and and you have to understand what the play, uh, the, the rules of the game are going to be. For instance, you know, I have the perception that digital clients are going to be less loyal than than traditional banking clients, and this is something that you may have to consider. Uh, the digital client will be, you know, loyal as long as the application, you, the interface that they are using is user friendly. The day there's another one that uh, is better, they will switch. Eh? Uh, first. Second, we need to understand very well what are the rules of the game. For instance, uh, this, this go game uh, thing. Uh, uh, we cannot use black boxes in banking because the day you go to a judge and you say, well, I mean, uh, why you didn't uh, give a loan to this, to this client? You say, well, I have no idea really. It was the, 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 algorithm. The, the algorithm that said that, uh, the judge is not going to accept that. So in banking, we need white boxes. We need, you know, uh, application of technology that allow us to explain, you know, what was the basis for the decision that was taken. So it's crucial that going forward we understand very well what are the new rules of the, of the game because uh, the environment is going to change, but I'm sure that there will be supervisors, conduct of business rule supervisors and judges at the end. Eh? So we have to also to be, to be careful going forward. Belen Roman, in your experience? Oh, yeah. I, would, I would agree with Belen. In, in the thing is, we have to follow our customer, and, and, and he or she will choose. It's not, uh, it's not to us to decide whether branches or... And I, I, so you have to follow them, and they will choose. And it's not only in terms of generation. I would say that it's also about uh, the, the type of product. So if you go for a mortgage, probably yeah. you have a completely different interaction than if you go for a deposit or, or investment decision. So, so, so for me, it is trying to really understand what our customer needs and how to get there, mm -hmm. which, which will change in time. And sometimes it will be an app. Sometimes it will be a web page. And, and that will evolve. Or a message servicing but, uh, or a sort of WeChat thing. But um, so I think it's, again, trying to, to make the best of their needs and trying to, to get there. That's, yeah, the, I think this, it's this is one of the main aspects. But at the same time, speaking with bankers, what, what and I didn't speak with Jean-Pierre Moustier ahead of the conference, but uh, speaking with bankers, what they say is that if 
we have to make a sustainable in the medium long term business plan. We have to have a clear idea of what regulation looks like and how supervision would be played towards us. <clears throat> Otherwise, we might put in place some business lines or make some decision that tomorrow might not be useful anymore. We might promise dividends that we might not be in the condition to give to our shareholders. What do you make of that in terms of giving also framework in the midterm of stability and predictability uh, to banks about the way they can build their business plans? Yeah. Well, I have three messages for, 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 for this question. First of all, um, I fully understand that you need a certain kind of predictability, a, a certainty yeah, um, in an environment where the macroeconomic facts change. Yeah? Um, so, so yes, we are working, and I hope that at the end of this year we will have finished uh, the Basel um, re reform agenda, yeah, and that we have a certain kind of predictability in there. But let us not fool ourselves. It's not only about capital cost with regard to regulation, capital um, um, requirements. Yeah, I mean, many, many other questions have to be asked about the. Um, um, not only the branches, but the question of how many products does a certain bank need for a certain amount of customers? Yeah, what kind of um, organization around it do you need? Um, um, how can you uh, change your cost structure uh, with, with regard to the organization around it? So um, whatever you uh, calculate as cost for a business, yeah, it is not the capital requirement, the, you know, the, the supervisory capital requirement, which is the leading cost driver. Uh, there are many other things are more important than um, uh, the cost uh, for, for the capital uh, requirements. Yeah? It's a part, mm -hmm. yeah? and still I believe you need to have a predictability, but it is not um, the main driver from, from my How perspective. How do you feel about that, Jean-Pierre Moussier? My Just slightly. Uh, yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I cannot disagree. I cannot yeah. disagree. No, I um, agree about the predictability. I, mm -hmm. I think what is important is actually not for the bankers, it is for investors that we need to have today a proper understanding of what will be the future regulatory requirement. Because we have, if I may say, creepy regulatory requirements which are coming up. We have finalizing Basel III, the so-called Basel IV. Uh, we have IFRS 9, which is coming up. We have the EBA guidelines, which are coming up. We have the fundamental review of the trading book. And so- this Basel III. But okay. no, yeah, 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 yeah. Basel, Basel IV. <laughs> yeah. So we, we have, um, and we have some ECB decision about non-performing loan uh, provision as well. So you have the you know a series of uh, additional regulatory actions. Each of them makes sense, and I'm not disputing them. Some of them might be correlated in terms of, you know, if you cover the capital for one, you will lower the capital for another one, for instance. If you have FRS 9 if and NPL, there will exactly, be some kind FRS, of... Exactly, and NPL, there is some kind of uh, correlation and, and, and of sure. Overlap, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But at the end, you know, we, we need to, to clarify that for investors so that they know where to allocate capital. And when they know where to allocate capital, then the market can function freely. But I would say that the decision of business model, as uh, was mentioned, does not really depend uh, on uh, you know, what the, the regulator wants to do. It's much more for investors and the proper allocation of capital. When we look at, very briefly, what we did at uh, Unicredit, and this is why I, I say it's important to keep your feet on the ground, which is you know, there are very simple and, and logical things to do. We had a, a risk issue, you know, NPL level too high. It was very obvious we did it, needed to reduce our NPL. And to do that, we need to be credible. So we need to sell a large amount of NPL initially to be able to raise capital. So take provision, sell NPL, raise capital, and convince investors that our books are properly marked. And by selling a very large uh, amount of NPL, 17.7 .7 billion, we convince investors that we have the right marks. It's about cutting costs. We are cutting in Western Europe on 20% of the cost, 25% of our branches in three years. 
it's a, it's a lot, basically. And, uh, you know, but we're doing that because, you know, we know that branches are going to be used less. You know, today, we have an objective that, you know, 95% of the transactions, which can be done online or multi-channel with an ATM online on the computer and an iPad, will be done there. And only 5% remaining will be done in the branch. We're at 92%, so we're almost there. So, the, 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 you know, our clients are moving there. For sure, for some of the advice on the mortgage side, they need to go to the branch, and they do that. On the corporate side, they transact directly with us on the internet on some of the product. They need our bankers to, to work with them. So it's an you know, adjustment everywhere. But the, you know, the, the, the path or the target is very clear. The costs have to be reduced. And this is not for us a three-year plan. You know, I've been mm -hmm. telling our investors, it's a 20-year plan. I mean, the, the direction of the cost base you know, will be lower. And we will transform the business model by transforming and training our team members because they will do a new job. We will have less back office uh, uh, professional and more people to advise our client. So this transformation is taking place. It's a simple. You know, you need to have a simple business model. We are simple pan-European commercial bank. That's our business model, you see. And then it's simple, it's straightforward, and we move step by step. Please remind that you can ask questions through menti.com. Use the code 1696.24 for your question. Well done. Uh, currently, banks are trading at historic lows, ratios, if you will look at book-to-value and so on. And when we speak with investors, they say we have to price in instability and things that rules might change and, uh, you, you know, something that we started to discuss. What do you make of this uh, after what Jean-Pierre Moustier said? I think that there are two reasons why, why price-to-book ratios can be, can be, you know, under under pressure. First, I mean, the quality of your balance sheet. Second, your profitability going forward. On the quality of the balance sheet, it's very clear that banks that have been able to clean faster are having a recognition in terms of, of better, you know, or price to book ratios. And, and going forward, I think that uh, what is still, you know, uh, we need to give clarity is how we are going to move in this new digital world that we are going to be facing, how we are going to adapt our business model to this, to this transformation. As, as if we don't have a clear roadmap, it's natural that uh, markets may have a doubt on the sustainability of business uh, models uh, going, going forward in this uh, uh, fintech, uh, fintech angle. Uh, I, I would say that I, I would agree with Javier, what he was saying that before. I mean, uh, fintechs, I mean, uh, four years ago, uh, I'm chairman of the Spanish Bank, Bank Association since a little bit less than four years. So four years ago, fintechs want to be uh, bankers. Now they want to be bought by a bank. Huh? Of course, the debt ratio of fintechs is 95%. So before you die, you want to be bought by a bank. Eh? So I think that the, the environment has changed. And I think that on, on both sides, there's more realism. On the side of the fintechs, they realize that they need this scale that can be given by, by, by a bank. And on the banking side, I think, well, if I can, you know, instead of trying to develop this, this interface, I have a fintech that offers that, uh, you know, and it's value for money. Well, instead of trying to develop this through, a, you know, or on my own IT, you know, uh, people, well, I mean, maybe it's cheaper to buy it. So I think that that we are getting there, and, and that we are a, being able to show the market that uh, we we understand what is going on. Of course, institution will differ in terms of their strategy. There are some institutions that are more more, let's say. Uh, aggressive in their digital transformation, others that are a little bit more more hesitant, but it's that's good. That's diversification. You know, not all of all of them are going to be right, and that means not all of them are going to be wrong. And, and I think that that's part of it. But uh, to make a long story short, I think that uh, the quality of the balance sheet is is a question mark that needs needs to be clarified. And I think that what the markets want is 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 a clear plan, and the second one is is you know business models digital transformation where I think that we are getting there. Well, I agree. I feel a subtle satisfaction in the fact that fintech are not taking over traditional banks, and I can understand this. But at the same time, we are going towards some very big changes. For example, PSD2, the new directive, that it's going to make a giant shift towards open banking. It won't mean just more competition, but also pricing and margins that might get lower. How do you see the impact of this new set of rules coming in? I think that one of the key things and following that conversation is, is the level playing field. And that means a few things. Uh, one is within the European landscape, and we, were, we had this debate this morning around 80s and things like that. So there's some of it that still needs to be closed down. And the other level playing field is, is with other 
potential competitors which are, which are not banks. And, and it's quite asymmetric. If you take the payment directive, it's quite asymmetric because you are obliged to give away your customers' data. It's not our data. It's their, their data. That's true. But we don't have access to, to, to other sources of data uh, in the same way. So there are, that, that creates a completely different landscape, I think, that, that could uh, eventually um, affect us. And, and this lack of level playing field in terms of regulation, it, I think it, 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 is, it is an issue that we should address at some point, because it's creating probably a, a lack of balance within, within the banks. And I, I, I want to mention, uh, you mentioned, Jose Manuel, is clean is scrapping. Uh, this is a monstrosity. Yeah. A monstrosity is that you give uh, one of these fintechs your 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 passwords for a single transaction, and they are able right. to extract all the information in your bank. The fact that we are having problems convincing you know uh, the regulators in Europe that this is a monstrosity is very worrying. Uh, uh, it's fine to have a level playing field. It cannot be based, you know, on uh, you know conduct of business rules. Uh, uh, elimination for these fintechs. It's a monstrosity. Uh, still, we have problems to convince the authorities that this should be actively uh, impeded by legislation. And the, Please. Uh, and there are other sources of, of this lack of level playing field. If you take the cloud services, yeah. I mean, it, Access. it is something that, that we need to, uh, uh, to use because of this change in the, in the architecture of our IT. So you do, I think, it's the reasonable thing is use, use cloud, but even then, it's quite um, unbalanced because you have very uh, few number of, of companies giving you those services. So they are an oligopoly, in fact. So you lose bargaining power, and still you need to comply with regulations. That, that It's difficult for you to, to do that because you depend on them. So there's a combination of things that have to do with these technical changes, I think, that are creating new Challenge. problems. And I think that we, we need to address those ones as well. Do you want to add something? Yes, I think that you know, any threat is an opportunity. So PSD2 could be seen as a threat. I see that as an opportunity as well, because you know, we can become integrators. So it's not only FinTech which can have access to the account of a client. I mean, we, we are today planning to be actually the FinTech and offer to other clients an integrator so that they can use us, uh, you know, and, and we will integrate the, the various account there with various banks. So, you know, we have always to think that banks can actually act and take opportunity from the regulatory evolution. There are some, uh, you know, very serious uh, uh, issues with PSD2 about who should be ultimately responsible if there's a, a data quality exactly. issue. Exactly. Because if it's a fintech with no capital, exactly. you know, who the client is going to turn to if there's a problem? Exactly. You might turn to the deep pocket, which is the bank. So this yeah. is being discussed, and exactly. we will deal with that, and we'll find a solution. So, uh, you know, PSD2, is it a threat? Yes, but, you know, this is when you are a threat that you run more quickly and you turn that in opportunities. The fintech is the same. So what we have to do today as bankers is just to make sure that we very dynamically review what we are doing. You know, I was so happy to have Apple Pay in Unicredit in Italy. So happy. For us, it's a wonderful opportunity. You know, is it a threat? No. Because you know, for us, you know, we, we develop our brand. You know, the visibility is increased. Our clients do more business with us using credit cards. You so you turn, that, you turn that as an opportunity. And this is what bankers need to do in the future. Sabine, do you want No, I can only agree. I mean, there are opportunities um, related and linked to it. But there needs to be a kind of balanced framework around it in order to ensure that you can draw. Uh, the opportunities, and I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm not so in depth um, um, in this issue as it is not really a solvency supervisor um, issue. It's more conduct, yeah. Um, but as a lawyer, I, I ask myself, as a lawyer and a customer of a bank, yeah, I ask myself, what's about the confidentiality? What kind of, um, what kind of rights? Um, do I have to say I do not want certain people to know yeah? uh, uh, certain things? Yeah? Um, here I have another question. Um, and then the question of what is, um, who is going to pay when there's some mistakes happening is something what needs to be 
um, still looked um, into it, yes, uh, for Let sure. Me go back. But it's not at the yeah. end anyway. If, if I'm informed um, of the timetable, uh, yeah, the discussions are still ongoing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me open to a question from the audience. And the first one is, again, on the relation between your job as a supervisor and the analysis of business model. Because uh, from the audience, they say, may we have additional hints on the mix between quantitative and discretionary assessment towards business models in this rep? Well, I mean, it's, um, it's one part is quantitative, one part is qualitative. I'm very sorry, yeah? Um, and if you have very strong quantitative evidence that something uh, might be questionable, then this will probably be picked up mm -hmm. and not be neutralized by the qualitative um, aspect, but it's a holistic view. You cannot, I mean, I cannot tell you that the quantitative um, aspects are 30% and 70% are the qualitative one. It depends on the facts. Supervising um, banks is, and, and this is for me uh, the most interesting um, development. See, when I started in the 90s, we were quite quantitative. Uh, related, you know, with regard to did the banks follow the capital ratio, certain other ratios. Then we moved in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, we moved into a very strong qualitative um, linked um, supervision. And now we bring together, as it is correct, quantitative and qualitative aspects, yeah? Um, so I think as a supervisor, you would be totally on the wrong foot if you were only to look into figures, yeah, because you need to have a gut feeling, you need to have a kind of forward-looking aspect, you need to have um, even an, a kind of assessment, what is the board member like? Is he a serious guy or not, you know? Yeah. Um, these kind of things have to, yeah, have to take into account. Um, how did the bank cope with challenges in the last five years? Yeah, what kind of project management do they have? Are they successful in project? Yeah. All these questions yeah. in the qualitative aspect have to come uh, together with some figures and benchmarking. Yeah. But just to illustrate and give an example without yeah. going into detail, if you look at risk, which is one of the pillars of SWEP, clearly there are some quantitative uh, items on the risk side, which um, you know, can be the cost of risk, the, the level of NPL. But there's also something which is very important, reviewed by the regulator, which is the risk culture. And you know, the risk culture is very qualitative, but it is extremely important because you, you cannot have a policeman behind uh, every bank employee. You need to have a guardian angel, and the guardian angel is the risk culture. So from a management point of view, we take care of reducing our NPL by selling them. We take care about having the proper risk process in order to have the right origination, the right monitoring of credit, the right recovery. But we take care as well of having the right risk culture which means that you know, we are telling our team members and we are working with them, both from an operational risk point of view, credit risk point of view, and market risk point of view, you know, to develop an awareness of the risk. Take the right risk, but be you know, very careful about what you do. Sabine and then Andre. Well, in abstract terms, I fully agree with you. Yeah? But we, we have to acknowledge, too, that if you want to change a risk culture, this takes more than just guidelines coming yes. from the management. It needs time to change the mindset of, of people. Yeah? So, um, and especially in this time, in these changing times, then um, we need uh, especially control and, and deep controls um, because okay, these are the, the challenging ones. Yeah? Well, let me just simply uh, compliment what, uh, what Sabine said. Because I can see where the question goes. It's much more quantitative than you think. I think um, the question implies that there's only a qualitative aspect to it. Absolutely not. Um, because when we look at it in the supervisory board, we would only look at a very, very quantitative analysis in order then to add the judgment. But the basis is a quantitative basis. Mm. This is interesting. Please. Yeah. Well, I think from a management point of view, the qualitative side and the, the culture of the bank in terms of behavior of individuals on, on the risk side, on the behavior of, um, you know, approach of various kind of risk, approach of the client, is actually extremely important. I mean, we, we have uh, you know, zillions of reports with a, a, a lot of uh, indicators, but at the end, as you mentioned, you know, the, to change the behavior of all our team members, it's uh, about pushing the right culture, and the right culture takes time, but it's as well an example from the top to start with in terms of no. discipline. You know, we have a, one of our, we have five business fundamentals. One of them is execution and discipline. And when you start a meeting, you say, 
we failed in our execution discipline fundamental, you know, people say, okay, we need to work on it and go deeper than that. And so I, I think I, I wouldn't underestimate, you know, the, the qualitative managerial angle as well of, of the risk culture, for instance. Well, there's a related question that I haven't received, but that I heard preparing the panel, which is, how do you evaluate these qualitative aspects? And do you have shadow COs somewhere? Do you have consultants? Do you have uh, algorithm? How do you do that? Because people in bankers, they are, they're asking. And when, when, once you gather tons of documents and then you crunch this, and how, how the process goes? You want me to explain um, to you how I do quantitative aspects within qualitative, huh? um, <laughs> because you asked for shadow CEO and <laughs> you know. No, no. I think um, for this you just need experience as a supervisor, and by asking questions to different banks within the same topic, you get a kind of feeling where the trend is going, what are best practices, what are standards, and whether the bank, which is in f sitting in front of you, fulfills the practices, the best practices, or the standard, or whether uh, it needs to, to raise yeah, um, the bar. So uh, supervisory judgment is not something what you can um, establish via a computer, and the algorithm, <laughs> yeah, but it is something what you establish uh, first with experience, um, and and second uh, with um, using the um, possibility, the opportunity to compare um, um, different banks with the same business activities, yeah, and how they deal in the market with their clients, with their risk, um, and and how they. Um, establish their um, their risk management. And that's where yeah? the SSM helps. Because in the past, let's say the Germans sat together mm -hmm. and had their own view, which always was a German view or an Italian view, whatever. Mm -hmm. And now we have 19 member states and we have, oh, admittedly, the meetings go far too long. <laughs> but, uh, but the debate is a good debate at the end of the day because you have many, many different inputs and a lot of experience, and the benchmark is much wider, and that helps. So um, furthermore, there is more neutrality in the view rather than a national bias. And you so, get a fresh view. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, when you are 20 years working as a national supervisor, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, in one box of thinking, and now you get together 19 different yeah, um, traditions, yeah? you, you come to know tools which you did not expect to see as a German. Mm -hmm. yeah? So when I have a question, for example, on real estate, I usually go to my Spanish colleague because they have a different experience in real estate prices than the Germans have. You could go to we, the Irish too, if you want. We, you could go to the Irish, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, you, 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 you move around yeah? and, and use the different experiences, the different traditions, the different tools you see Mm -hmm. um, we and were that always means asked you for the shipping to... loans, by the way. Yeah, yeah we were asked by the shipping, <laughs> yes, yes. I can imagine. We are, we are specialists in shipping finance. <laughs> uh, there's a question, again, about IT and investment. In How much do you invest at Unicredito in IT yearly? Well, we invest a lot, but for the transformation of the, the bank, so which is mm -hmm. purely the transformation, not the not management the of the ongoing the side, uh, in the next three years, so including 2017, we invest 1.6 billion euros, 600 million in 17, yeah. 500 in 18, 500 Because there's a question from the audience, and they're asking, do banks have enough IT savvy board members, and do supervisors have enough IT knowledge to monitor banks sufficiently? First, IT in, into the board. Well, I think to the board is, uh, I think there is uh, two, two different types of knowledge. One is uh, about evolution of client and the new digital world. And clearly, there's not enough of, of uh, such uh, skills in, in, in a board today. And the other one is uh, more you know, traditional IT knowledge and skills in order to see how we can engineer the shift from the traditional legacy system towards a, a new system. There, there are some uh, uh, expertise, and, and we're managing that. But I, I fair to say that if we look at our board today, and you know, we need uh, more uh, board members who can bring this fresh view about what we'll call it the digital revolution. Well, um, IT knowledge is a rare commodity, for sure. 
Um, we increased our um, staff with special IT knowledge in the last year in order to, you know, to increase our on-site inspections. Um, but we do have, for sure, a certain yeah, there, there is scarcity in there. So we work together with other public authorities. Um, which deal with this matter, and uh, we work together. I mean, uh, with all of our national um, uh, colleagues. Um, and um, um, at the end, if we if we think that we need additional um, um, resources, then we take consultants. Yeah. So the, the way I look at it is that uh, if you are a supervisor, you better be um, technology neutral, because if we move too fast. And if we uh, express an opinion too early, we're going to shift the market into a certain direction. Now, while Sabine earlier said we're not the better bankers, she rightly said that, we're also not the better technology experts. But what we need to look at is, um, is the IT system plausible? Does it cover what is expected from it? Um, is there a chain of command all the way to the mm -hmm. top? Is the, is the responsibility taken correctly? Are the, um, the dangerous... Um, correctly identified? Is there enough thought process about it? But for us to say, this is the technology of the future, and this may not be the technology of future, it's not our job, nor our skill level, nor our mandate whatsoever. We have to be neutral on this, and the market has to settle. How would you handle this from inside of the board of Santander? I think there's not, no one silver bullet. You need to do uh, many things. You need to have certain profiles, which we, we do. We, we also have an international board of advisors, so you have tech experts that, that are helping us, and, and the board itself is, uh, you, you need to be retrained once and again as a board member, as a citizen, or as a mother in my case as well. So you need to understand the world you're living in. So you, you need to keep on being trained once and again, and so, so we, we go to Silicon Valley, so you, we, we keep on training um, ourselves, trying to understand. And and, uh, and and supervisors and regulators can also learn. Yeah? And, uh, Many I, thanks. I mean, no, I, and I will understand why I'm saying this. Uh, now we'll understand. We will understand why I'm saying this. Uh, Jose Manuel was referring to the cloud. Uh, com, uh, you know, the cloud uh, storage. Uh, that discussion was held in the Bank of Spain when I was at the Bank of Spain 10 years ago. I remember the first reaction that we had. I mean, uh, where's the data? Well, they don't know where's the data. Oh my God, they don't know where's the data. That's kind of outrageous. No. Now we understand that cloud, uh, cloud uh, storage, you diversify uh, where the data is, and in that respect, is safer than a, a, you know, a central database that can be attacked by, by any cyber crime. So, of course, you evolve, and you don't need a lot of uh, IT expertise. It's just to understand you know, what are the pros and cons, to understand what are the potential benefits in terms of resilience of the system. Is a centralized system more resilient than a decentralized system? No. And, and uh, I think that we can, we can learn and we can move forward. And uh, it's going to be you know, a challenge for us because we are not a technological expert and it's going to be a challenge for the supervisors. But of course, we can learn from experience. Of course, we are learning from experience. Yeah, let me raise another point, which is many business model, many business plans currently, they're not viable, they're not sustainable because they do not have the uh, scale that is requested by the market. And we heard this morning, Daniel Wee, she said, I'm optimistic. I think there will be more merger in the future. There will be more consolidation in the market. Do you think that consolidation is a key for sustainability of business model in the future, Sabine Leutenschlager? Well, it will be one solution, but I would not put um, first your, your, your general remark that we have many, many banks which do not have a sustainable well, business model. They're looking model. for a sustainable business model. Oh, well, we have many banks who are still in the process of process of adapting uh, their business model but who still or which still have uh, already have a view where they want to go to and what kind of tools and instruments they want to use in order to to achieve uh, their goal we have about two dozen banks who for many years already earn um, above the average and quite close to their cost of capital and um, let us be very clear too as we were talking about this cycle yeah um, we all, as supervisor, and I'm pretty sure as banker too, we wish that the banks would always earn above their cost of capital. Yeah, but um, uh, w through the cycle, um, uh, with regard to the question of resilience too, um, we have to live with years where 
banks do not earn their cost of capital. And this is not a problem as long as it is not too long. Yeah? Um, that's why we wanted to increase the resilience in banks, for, for them to be able to withstand two or three years of, how do you say that in English, a drought. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Tough times. Yeah. Yeah? Um, and that's, uh, that's the whole regulation and reform agenda mm -hmm. uh, about. Yeah? Um, so uh, that we should not uh, forget. It is rather the question of when you list the challenges, you know, and this was pretty much listed by, by Jose Maria, do you have the appropriate <coughs> mitigating measures for the banks in a time period where they are still able uh, to act? And here you can see that the European banks, most of them, yeah, are on their way forward. Some are already there. Some are pretty, you know, close to their goal, and some have to still do a little bit more of a homework. Yeah. So I would not like to um, put all of the banks in one bucket. I don't like that at all, especially not when we are talking about 125 banking groups in 19 different countries with 19 different um, challenges. Yeah. So we have two dozen banks which for many years already are very well on track. And let me tell you, they differ in size. They come from different countries. They have different business models. They have different cost structures. You know, what So it is, not, it is not the one business model which is the solution. Mm. Yeah? And when we are talking about digitalization, when we are talking about regulation, which increases trust in banks, which decreases funding cost, yeah? Um, when we are talking about low interest rate environment, which is a challenge for a longer period for the banks, but which decrease funding cost yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. This, this all are challenges. This all are different solutions. You know, cost structure, uh, be better cost um, uh, structure, uh, using digitalization, using opportunities uh, like the PSD2, etc. But it's not the one solution which fits to all, but it is rather um, a kind of conglomerate of, of different measures. No, a merger should not be a taboo, but they are also not a panacea. You know, it really depends on the individual case. And to talk about it in general um, doesn't really answer the question when it really comes to the issue. The way I look at it, though, is from a supervisory point of view, in mathematics, two times negative becomes positive. Doesn't work in banking. No. Yeah, for sure not. So you have to have a very complementary um, set of um, um, banks, and um, it may make a whole lot of sense, especially in a Europeanized banking world, but um, you have to go case by case. And not I I'm not going to make a general uh, suggestion, and it's not on our mind to see more or less mergers. It's for the market to decide. But do you think that different size of banks should need different approaches or rules yes. or yes. So proportionality? Yes. Sabine Rutenschlager, what do you think of that? Well, proportionality, yes, and let me come back to the consolidating question because I did not answer it. I would love to see more consolidation in some of the markets. We have some countries where we have quite a strong co uh, competition yeah, and where you could think about you know, having a stronger consolidation, and we have markets where this is not the case. But every merger we are talking about should make sense. And there's another nice phrase in German saying, two ugly ducks don't make a swan. Yeah? Um, uh, so I mean, what should come out of um, a merger is a better, uh, a reliable, a sound, uh, a viable bank uh, with a bright future. Yeah? Um, um, so this is the most important thing. Yeah, on, on, on this issue of proportionality, we were in a panel in the mm. IMF, so we yeah. reproduced the discussion over there. Uh, I, I think that we have to be, I mean, careful with the discussion. There, there's room for proportionality, greater proportionality, no doubt, but you have to be very careful. I come from a country where non-sophisticated institutions were created a massive problem for the country because suddenly, you know, they became, you know, uh, the, the, the whole lot of them, you know, uh, systemic for, for the country. So sometimes unsophisticated institutions can create very sophisticated uh, problems. Second, once you need to decide, you know, what is proportionality, 
uh, we talk about a, a simplicity, simplicity surcharge uh, in the IMF uh, uh, meetings. Uh, but for instance, corporate governance. Well, let's simplify corporate governance requirements. Really, I mean, that's a challenge in these small institutions. In fact, that was probably the, the basic problem that I saw in Spain uh, uh, in the crisis year. So we can agree on the, on the principle, but we have to be extremely careful how we roll out this because it can be, I mean, a very, very dangerous uh, thing. Yeah, there's a question from the audience about the risk culture that you mentioned before. Uh, how would you evidence as a bank the right culture in terms of risk and uh, even more difficult, how do you get a true view as a supervisor? First, the bank. Well, I think that uh, the, the risk culture, the culture of the bank actually is not only the risk culture, starts from the top. And uh, you know, it is extremely important for employees but also for our clients that uh, we show that one, we are an institution which behaves properly so we can attract the right kind of employees and they can develop and blossom. And two, if we behave properly, our clients are happy to do business with us. And you know, I was meeting a client this week who said, I'm going to do more business with you because the other bank I'm doing business, they are a bit too arrogant and I think you're doing the right thing. So you know, the risk culture or the culture of the bank is not only about you know, fancy stuff, but it's about you know, true business and, and, and true development, which is extremely important. It comes from the top, from the board, having the proper governance from the management, applying to yourself what you ask to others. When we you know, restructured and transformed Unicredit last year, we took very tough actions in terms of remuneration of the management, starting with mine, reduction of salary, no bonus. You know, and that, that is extremely important. And then we have defined a certain number of key actions, the five business principles, which we use everywhere. In the 14 banks where we are present, you have panels in the entrance of the bank, in all the meeting rooms, about our five business principle. People are evaluated along the lines of five business principle. We give objective along the lines of five business principle. When I make a presentation to the employee, say, what are five business principles? You don't imagine how difficult it is for people to remember five business principles initially because, you know, they say, oh, I don't know, I need to look on the internet. I say, no, you need to look at it. And you have to be very careful when I came to the bank and asked, what are the values of them? I say, look on the internet. Nobody used the values. And values are something a little bit, you know, in the air. The business principles today are very, very concrete. They are about client, they're about our risk, they're about, I mean, you know, synergy, they're about people development, and they're about execution discipline. That's the five business principles. That's the guardian angel with our team members is the attractivity of the bank for the employees, the attractivity of the bank for, for the client, and it is extremely important for the regulator as well. So for me, it is one of the key issues that we develop in the bank. Sabine, Dr. Schlager. Well, I mean, it starts with an easy check and then it gets more difficult, I have to admit. Yeah? It starts with asking um, uh, the bank what kind of risk appetite do you have, and did you define it in written form, and does everybody know in your bank what kind of risk you would like to take and what kind of risk you do not like um, to take? That's the first thing. Then the next question is, did you align uh, your remuneration practice according um, uh, to this risk appetite? Does it fit together, or are they contradicting? Um, incentive. Yeah? The next question is, for example, do you talk um, and inform your board members, um, your supervisory board, if you have a two-tier system, your non-executive directors, um, uh, diligently enough about the risk profile and the involvement and um, the, the scenarios you are taking for your stress testing, for example, on time, meaning that they have um, um, the time to look at it? Yeah, do you have a discussion during your board meetings um, about it? Or is it just you know, an item which moves th through the agenda via an A point? Yeah? Um, so you have some um, hooks as a supervisor where you can see whether there is a defined risk culture and whether this risk culture um, is taken into account in the daily working. Yeah? Plus, but then you look at the relationship to capital, of course. Exactly. I yeah. mean, that um, is, yes, you have to, yeah. I mean, the, the, the quantitative aspect comes yeah. in there. But then comes the difficult part. Belen, then comes the additional qualitative mm. aspects. What kind of a judgment do you have about the seriousness of the, um, uh, the assumptions taken by the banks with regard to their risk? 
Yeah? And what kind of scenarios uh, do they have? Do they have a, a bad scenario? And do they have uh, mitigating factors, et cetera? Then comes the capital again. So this is then the more difficult part. I think that as a board member, one of the key things is how the risk committee works. Because if it works well and you, you recognize it when you see it, I mean, it's, um, you do have a very thorough view of, of the risk culture of the institution, uh, whether you have debates around risk appetite, but if you connect that with, with uh, the resolution exercises or, or the ICAP and ILAP. So the thing that you do understand how risks interact, and not only financial risks, so you do need to have a wider understanding of risk, including cyber. So things that, that are not, not, not that evident if you think in financial terms. But I think that, that if you have a, a well-functioning board and specifically a risk committee, it helps a lot because it gives a very strong sign out to the whole institution that this matters. And, and I think that's, that's a very powerful instrument. Uh, without, for, for the board, what is important is what are the indicators which are pushed by the management to the board? And what are the indicators which are not brought by the management to the board? Because we, we manage the bank with a specific set of indicators. Some of them are qualitative, some of them are quantitative. And what I find extremely interesting all the time when I discuss with my team members and afterwards when I present to my board is what my team members do not tell me about how they, they steer their business. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you miss as a key indicator a specific risk angle, which can be a non-financial indicator or financial one, then you know that the, you know, the, the division is not working on it. And I think for, for the board or for the managers, looking at what is not looked at is actually more important than what is being looked at. And it's always what I, I'm looking at and making sure that the board is aware what our priorities and what we're not really looking at because it's a second priority. Well yeah, just to mention something that uh, has been mentioned by, by, by you, but uh, I think that we need to, to raise awareness. It's not just risk culture, it's, it's the culture of the bank, the, the relationship of the bank with its clients. Uh, basic, you know, uh, rules that need to be, uh, you know, in the m mindset of, of the people at the top, but also at the, uh, by the people of, of the bottom. Uh, if we don't have in the banking industry the right culture, the right banking culture, uh, the price that we are going to pay, the price that we are pay paying is what we could call judiciary randomness. By judiciary randomness, I mean that, uh, you know, if we are not able, ex ante, to have the right culture that minimizes problems with our clients, a judge will come out and later on, you know, we will we'll be subject to further pressure, probably uncontrollable and probably, you know, unfair in the sense that, uh, you know, you end up not, uh, you know, really uh, identifying the rotten uh, sure. apples. Uh, yeah. So it's extremely important. It's not just about risk. It's about having the right culture. Yeah, but you mentioned culture and capital. There's a question from the audience asking, uh, what's the sustainable cost of capital in your view? It's more likely 7, 8, 11 percent. Where do you see it? Doesn't it depend on the business model? <laughs> and it on the risk on <laughs> for our profile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is the same. Yeah. Can, can I have a go? I'm not a banker, so mm. probably I'm the one that can, can have a, a, you know, a go. We have discussed that, uh, Stefan, in the past, uh, if you remember. It's a little bit bizarre because cost of capital was 10%. You know? We have made banks safer. You know, after the crisis, we have had a huge clean out. And what is the cost of capital? 10%. It's kind of stubborn then. Interest rates, zero. Cost of capital, 10%. It's kind of a puzzle. Uh, probably we are in a transition phase. But going forward, I would expect cost of capital to be more commensurate with, with where the, real, the interest rate is, where the real interest rate is, and, and more uh, diverse depending on the business model of the bank. If you have a more volatile business model, you will have probably, you need to have a higher cost of capital. But it's a little bit of a puzzle that we are stuck with this 10% figure, you know, for, for quite, a, quite a long time. Probably it's a transition where, where the market is still perceived the banks are as risky as, as we transform. And, and going forward, we are able to convince the, the, the market that probably for all business models, you don't need a 10% cost of Being capital. Like any clues about why the cost of capital remain stable? Well, I think that there is still a, a certain amount of uncertainty about the, the forward-looking aspects of, of the business of, of banks. Yeah, we, we talk about digitalization and new competitors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We talk about NPLs. We talk about the regulation, which is not yet uh, fixed. And I think weighing this against the very low funding cost, um, against more 
uh, resilience in the banks, more capital, more liquidity, better risk management, better governance, etc. Um, the investors are not yet there in, in you know, they did not digest um, uh, fully. Um, so I agree with Jose Maria. Yeah. Please. I think it was mentioned, it really depends on the business model. We have uh, 14 banks, I mean, 14 different countries. The cost of capital of our bank in Russia mm -hmm. is more or less twice the cost of capital of our bank in, in Germany. So based on you know, the, you. the business model and the cursor, we, we have a, a, you know, a different cost of capital. So we never, and we don't comment about what is our own cost of capital. The market defines it. So what we need to do is to make sure that the perception of investors is as such that they see our cost of capital is lower. So what do we do? We need to reduce the risk profile of our balance sheet. And you know, for us, you know, it is extremely important to keep reducing NPL in our balance sheet. From time to time, I have reaction of some of my Italian colleagues about, but why do you sell NPL to investors who are going to make money out of it? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, because you know, the profits that we might not make on our NPL, our investors make it 20 times because our share price should go up because our risk profile is going down because our cost of capital goes down. So you know, we are simplifying our business model. We make sure that our earnings are going to be more stable. We have a clear explanation about the strategy. We need to have recurring uh, revenues, recurring profits uh, all the time. So it's a long-term process in order to make sure that investors see the bank as uh, you know, having a stable revenue stream, stable net income stream, and a lower risk profile. And it's only over time that the cost of capital can go down. And it's a very important component today of the share price performance in the low-growth environment. Well, I think your colleagues are questioning you because you set a benchmark with the price of your it, 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 it is a, 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 a mixed issue as well. We didn't send a benchmark or a price. Our large transaction was made of different asset class. Each asset class has a different provisioning level, and the blended amount is the blended amount. But it does not mean that all NPLs in Italy should trade at the average price where we, we, we traded our portfolio. They can be completely different. Well, we started. And let us perhaps please. add too. I mean, if you lose confidence in a crisis like we all experienced in 2008, it is not so easy to get this confidence back. Yeah. And you need to have a track record before the investors will come back with their confidence. And this is why regulation is not only, and supervision is not only cost, but yeah. also has yes. an other, a flip, the other flip side mm -hmm. of it, which mm -hmm. is a more stable, more secure, um, trust, trusted uh, banking system. And I would say, more regulation is better. So if I say that my colleagues in the different banks are, are going to go after me, but you know, to a certain extent, <laughs> that was your career. I have a no, that's, that's I'm it. finished. No, that, I'm, 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 yeah, no, no, but I didn't tell you I sent my resume to the ECB. You see, to a but, no, but the, you know, more regulation is better. Not too much regulation, though. I mean, but you know, more regulation is better so that investors see that there is, a, you know, consistency in uh, the way banks can be managed, and you know, the risk profile of the banks is going down. And I would say today, if we have less regulation in the U.S., remains to be seen mm -hmm. what's going to happen. U.S. banks might be seen as casino banking versus safely managed bank in Europe that should benefit, be beneficial for European banks. Yeah, we started discussing sustainability of uh, business model in a cycle which is in a nice recovery. You said 2% is not that much, but it's better than what it we experienced. It is much better than before. Yeah, and uh, at the same time, we know quantitative easing will be unwinding slowly starting next year. How do you feel this will impact, the both effects will impact your profitability, your business plan? Mario Draghi this morning mentioned that you know, bankers can complain about low interest rate, but they forget to say that there are some other benefits. And clearly, the cost of capital is going down. And uh, you know, our clients are today start to invest again. So you have uh, always mitigating factor. We, we communicated about the sensitivity of our revenues to short-term interest rate. It's 170 million for 10 basis points when we have negative rates at minus 30 percent. So you know, uh, three times uh, 170 million is a lot of money. You know, our 20 billion revenues is not going to change the, the, the needle, basically. So I think that you know, when uh, we have a, a, a different policy from the ECB, you know, the good news is maybe that interest will go back up. Is it going to change our profitability? Is it going to improve it? The much better news, it means that the economy is doing better, so we should have more sustained revenues in terms of fees, transaction banking, financing fees. Okay. Our cost of risk should remain lower. So, and that's a very good time when the situation is better to push for more transaction 
transformation because that's you transform the bank and you change when you're not under threat. If you, you know, when you're under threat, you cannot change. You are reactive, and we need to be proactive when the environment is better, and that's what we do at Unicredit. Well, I mean, if you transfer this, and I fully agree to our push for reducing NPLs, you know, this is exactly the reasoning. We are in a growth period. Uh, the recovery, um, the economic recovery is solid. It is broad-based. We have mm -hmm. growth in 17 consecutive quarters, if I uh, remember correctly. Yeah? The labor market is improving. Um, business investment is improving. Sentiment, sentiment, sentiment sentiments are, are improving. All the projections, um, um, they, were, uh, mm -hmm. they were lower than, than what happened in, in reality. So now is the time. Now is the time. Um, uh, to clean up and, and to use this room for maneuver in the best um, way in order to um, prepare, you know, for, um, yeah, uh, growing business activities. Yeah. And only, only healthy and clean uh, banks There's can, also some concern yeah? about that, you know, because their concern is that pushing fire sales of assets will leave holes in the balance sheet of banks that will have to raise more capital and get weaker on the market. Yes, but, but uh, end, again, I mean, this, is, this is for me a view which is very narrow-minded on sales mm. uh, of NPLs. Um, the um, SSM very clearly said already two years ago, asked governments uh, to already two years ago to change, for example, improve their legal and judicial a system in order to help banks to um, do a quicker workout with their NPLs. So um, we see this NPL issue in a very broad um, a scale. We um, addressed it with the March publication, the stock, um, saying very clearly we want the banks to have individual targets, we want to have uh, strategies, we want to see a good governance, uh, aligned uh, remuneration, for example, a good incentive system to reduce NPLs. We are now talking and consulting a paper for the new NPLs so that uh, banks do know uh, when we are assessing them on an individual basis what is the starting point uh, for our assessment, and then we do the individual part. Yeah. And, and then, and then, and I think this is very important, <coughs> and then we need in parallel a better environment um, um, uh, promoted by the governments uh, and by private um, investors too, um, uh, to, to deal with the NPLs, um, to assure that banks can deal quicker with the NPLs. And here, um, some people still have to do their homework, to be very uh, clear. It cannot be that we have in the euro area, um, we have countries which do not need um, one year mm -hmm. in order to do a workout and to reprocess yeah. collateral, and we have countries where you need on average 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is a difference, you know. Sabine, yesterday, your colleague Ignacio Visco said whenever you tackle the NPLs with mm -hmm. an action like that, you have mm -hmm. to uh, keep in mind financial stability and mm -hmm. value the impact of this. Did you yeah. make any analysis of the impact of the guidelines on the banks and the needs for more capital applying those guidelines? Um, well, again, in March, we published qualitative aspects. Uh, so. An impact analysis on qualitative aspects is quite difficult to do. When we are talking about the new NPLs, yes, we calculated uh, an impact on uh, with regard to the secured as well as the unsecured part uh, with different phasing in, and we will see what the consultation will bring for this new um, so you're NPLs. Open to change yes, but let me be very clear too. Nobody, nobody says. Um, that we push banks for selling their NPLs in the next year and to be cleaned up in the next year. What we are saying is we need to have a plan yeah, over several years in order to have a, um, the, the, the goal achieved that at one point in the future, yeah, um, um, yeah. the stock yeah, um, will be very much reduced as well as well new NPLs will be provisioned um, uh, conservatively. Now, um, I don't want to comment on, on the discussion on the supervisory board um, of the SSM, but I would like to give you something to think about. It happened at the very beginning of me being a banker, which was like uh, at the end of the 80s. I remember JP Morgan coming out with an annual report saying, 
we have written off 100% of our Latin American debt. And five years later, I, met, I joined JP Morgan, and uh, we talked about it, and I said, was that a smart move? And they said, we made more money on the new business. We were able to extend yeah. after, after writing off, you know, that you yeah. need to be able to afford this, of course. But they were the first ones in there, again, mm -hmm. could pick and choose and do the deals. So this is something which we discussed a little bit earlier of being ahead of the curve, uh, if, if possible. <laughs> if you are ahead of the curve, you may be selling when the market is not yet ripe and you may not have the best prices, but you will able to pick and choose the sort of business strategically in a better way. So it really depends on where you want to be and where you can be. But clearly, you have an advantage if you clean the deck early. Uh, I can not agree more with you about cleaning up the deck. This is what we did at Unicredit, and we can see the benefit. This being said, I fully agree with Ignacio Visco as well, that we need to look at the impact on, on a country in terms of additional capital requirements if the measures are not phased in properly, because then we might take a, a one-off impact uh, which uh, uh, could uh, prevent some of the banks to operate properly. So I think what is very important is to set the direction of travel and the target, and that rules to have uh, you know, the proper path to go to, to the target. And you know, from time to time, you know, it might be important to you know, move a little bit less quickly, but to be very firm of where we want to be, but not take only one regulation, but all the regulation. And that, for me, is extremely important. We speak about, for instance, the calendar provisioning, which is the, the topic we just covered. But it's not only about calendar provisioning. It's about EBA guidelines, which are being pushed. It's uh, uh, about IFRS 9, and it's about uh, Basel 4, Basel 3. When you combine everything, no, we, you need to have a look at what are the, the relative impacts, because if you just sum up you know, the absolute uh, impact one by one, the additional capital requirement is huge. So you have to see how it compensates, what is the proper way to move into that, what can be the mitigating factor, and the regulator as well can work with us in order to develop the mitigating factor, the transposition of European laws of some of uh, you know, the rules, for instance, on Basel IV, you know, to make sure that what we do makes sense, both from a regulatory point of view, but also from a macro prudential point of view in a specific countries. And I think it's finding the right balance, which is important. And uh, you know, Ignacio Visco is right, Mr. Dombret is right, and you know, we, it's a, you know, just a, for each bank or each country, there's a different solution. Let's be careful that the cursor is put at the right level. Well done. What I hate of, of, of this discussion, we Europeans, we are very bad at marketing. Uh, Paul was offering us the view from Harvard uh, on, on this issue of non-performing laws, which is very negative, of course. We create a lot of noise, and then, you know, people from outside Europe do not understand what is going on. But we are making huge progress. Here, yeah. here you have... Here you have yeah. two banks that have yeah. made, you know, incredible transactions mm -hmm. in the non-performing loans sphere. <laughs> two examples here. Of course we are making progress. Of course yeah. we are moving forward. And all this noise we create every time we need to discuss something, it's so negative for, for the view of, of European Eurozone banks outside, uh, you know, uh, the Eurozone that uh, we should be doing better, frankly speaking, because it's a pity. We are doing a lot of progress. Uh, well. I was thinking exactly that, because in our case, we, we did a deal of 30 billion deal, which was, mm -hmm. I would say, large. And, 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 and if you think in terms of Spain, Spain has, has gone through a phase where we have developed a servicing industry that we didn't have. And that helps a lot when dealing with NPLs, because all of a sudden, you create sources of additional liquidity. So I think that that, that is something that was not there five years ago, and it's there. And it's helping the whole the, 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 the Spanish financial system. So I think that that uh, we, we we should have a balanced uh, view. I think. Yeah, and let me ask my very final question because we have to wrap it up a bit. And Andreas Dombret, you said recently, once Basel III is finalized, we should take a short break and look at unintended consequences and whether the new rules are impacting in the right or wrong way. So should we prepare to a time out, something as they call it? I have to be very careful now with my answer, otherwise I can't <laughs> go back to the Basel Committee. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I really mean that... Um, when you finalize something, the message is in the word. Um, then it is, for at least for a certain period of time, you should sit back and reflect on uh, where you are and where you want to go. And we are doing too many things at the same time. We need to finalize Basel III. We cannot live with this variability of risk-weighted assets. We cannot live with these two different are you uh, systems. Um, 
I am not predicting, but uh, I'm very relaxed. So maybe I'm not close, but I'm relaxed uh, about, about that we get this done. Uh, in a, in a, so, so, but we need to take not a time out. We need to reflect on on in regulation um, and look at the entirety and all those implications, some of which are unintended, and we cannot go on forever, always regulating and okay. continuing. I fully agree with on that one, but I think what will be extremely important after Basel III, but the ABA guidelines are fresh nine that you know we have certainty for investors for a certain period of time because our investors are providing us with capital, equity, or with debt. They need to know exactly what will be the capital requirement for banks. And at this stage, we don't know. We don't know how Basel IV is going to be implemented, what, what will be the Basel IV agreement, what will be the transcription into European laws. The EBA has published some guidelines. We need to have visibility. We need to look at how it's going to interact and what could be the mitigating factor between them. So I think I fully subscribe to the point that we should pause and give investors the proper visibility. Mm -hmm. That will be in favor of the European banks just to be able to attract the proper uh, capital from long-term investors. Sabine, a little bit well, I mean, for sure, we should um, uh, close now the Basel uh, reform agenda uh, with hopefully a successful uh, finish with Basel III, and then we should start implementing. And um, I mean, even as a lawyer, I'm a little bit exhausted uh, with regard to um, creating new rules. I would like to implement and work with them now. And I agree with, uh, with um, Andreas, too, that you always have to reflect. And the FSB has um, an own topic there, evaluation of the overall framework and whether it fits together. And I think this is a good uh, starting point to do it now. Yeah, uh, but, um, uh, but overall now, I think we are finished after 10 years of reform agenda. And, and now we work uh, with it. All right. I think this was a conclusion. So. Yeah. Thanks so much to everyone for attending and a round of applause to our panelists today. Thank you. Leave the stage, let me just uh, thank everybody for attending. So we're coming to the end of the conference. Uh, thank you to the audience uh, and for participating, being engaged and uh, staying here all day.